five. I welcome everyone uh, who has joined, who's joining this uh, webinar series. It's a co-work webinar series dedicated to enthusiasts of coherence and coherence properties of X-rays sources. Uh, so we are having a nice um, uh, reaction from people. Uh, we had already first uh, webinar last week uh, where Pablo um, Villanova Perez introduced the concepts of coherence. And today uh, I'm very pleased to introduce you Thomas. Um, Thomas Eckerberg um, is a researcher uh, of the Laboratory of Molecular Biophysics in Uppsala University. Uh, his expertise really lies in the developing algorithms for coherent diffraction imaging, for structural, st uh, structural studies of viruses and macromolecules. Uh, he will also, uh, he will just bring us in this world of algorithms and routines to uh, make a good use of coherence from data collection to data analysis. And he will give us also some examples at the end of his own research. Um, so at this point, I will give the word to Thomas uh, and thank everyone for being here. Okay, thank you so much for that. And uh, just to check, can someone just confirm that you can hear me okay? And see my slides there. Yeah, with me, you're right. You can okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm really pleased to, to be here and talk about well, a little bit about my research, but mainly about, you know, current diffractive imaging and sort of what makes it what makes it great. And it's uh, sad that I can't be there in person, but I send you my greetings from, you know, a cold and infected Uppsala. Um, I, this talk is going to be, I think, uh, quite heavy on, you know, methods and algorithms and and I'm going to give you some some examples but I think also one reason to sort of talk a lot about you know the methods and the kind of data that we get and, and what we can do with it is that in my experience I feel like that sort of feeds back a lot into experimental design and to really understand sort of what you can do with this method you have to understand you know, how you do it and, and sort of what you need in your data um, and and I'm, I've tried to make this into sort of uh, to cater to a mixed audience, so so some things will probably be, or I'm sure will be repetitions for some of you, but 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 hopefully there are sort of everyone can find something. Like. Oh, and I, I would also sort of take the time to say that if you have any questions, like uh, I, I don't mind at all if you interrupt during the talk. There will hopefully be time towards the end as well. Um, but but if if it's something that you know you think about and you feel like you want an answer to sort of to follow the rest of the explanation, then it's better that you ask and give it. Okay, so um, then let's uh, start to talk about, you know, to talk about, you know, coherent interactive imaging. We, I think we'll have to start by, uh, you know, putting it into context by, by relating it to what I call conventional imaging. Uh, so, so, you know, this is the most silly and, and uh, and simple explanation you can have of an optical microscope. You have the light source, an object, and a lens. So light diffracts from the from the object, and it's sort of the lens will kind of bring it together to a perfect image in sort of what's called the image plane here, where you can see the la hopefully larger version of the duck. Now, uh, if you want to use this method to study really small things like this smaller duck, for example. Uh, you might know that you know optical light is not going to work. You need to sort of use something with a shorter wavelength, like an X-ray source, like which I've illustrated here, which is kind of light bulb anode kind of source. And uh, you can see that you know light diffracts in the same way from the smaller duck, um, but I'm not with the lens there because you know lenses are problematic when it comes to when it comes to X-rays. It's possible to make and 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 sort of to understand that. I mean, you probably know this, but you know. You compare it to, for example, medical x-ray, you know, x-rays just go straight through most things, so and, and, and will go straight through, more or less straight through the lens. It's possible to make some kind of, of x-ray lens. So, for example, there is uh, one type of lens called zone plates, which I've tried to illustrate here, which will, uh, which will essentially work as a lens. And you can do, like, there's a whole field of uh, x-ray micros microscopy that, that uses this kind of principle. Um, the problem is that, um, so first of all, 
uh, this is sort of better representation. So a lot of the x-rays will either go straight through or, or sort of not end up uh, forming the image. So uh, so you lose a lot of your a lot of your x-rays, which means that you have to put extra damage into your sample because you have to put extra radiation into your sample. Um, and um, on, in addition to that, if you want to image really small things like like by like biological molecules or something like that, you really need closed atomic resolution, which means that if you want you need a sound plate to work, you have to manufacture it close to the same resolution, which means that for really small things, the sound plate is not super accurate. So uh, you might end up with a somewhat blurred version of your object. Okay, so the solution, or well. Because one solution at least is to say, okay, forget about the lens, forget about the zone plate, and instead just add a detector of where we had the lens, collect the uh, the diffraction over there, and then try to use a computer to sort of figure out or sort of calculate backwards what must the object have looked like to create this kind of diffraction pattern. And uh, this is essentially the principle behind it coherent diffractive imaging. Some, some people call it coherent diffractive imaging or coherent diffraction imaging. I grew up saying diffractive imaging, so that's what I'm going to keep saying today. Um, and why is it called like this? So diffraction is, I'm sure you know, um, or one sort of bit shaky definition is the bending of a wave around an object such that it behaves like a new source. And you can see that this is true for the light reaching this duck sort of changed direction and the, the duck itself behaves kind of like a new source. But this was true also for the, for the case of the optical microscope. Um, and coherent, which I mean, um, you've, you've had lectures on this, so this is a sort of too much dumbed down version of it, but essentially it is all having the same wavelength. And the reason I'm using sort of this dumbed down version of it is that I want to argue for, for why you need coherence for refractive imaging. And you know, X-rays, just like optical light on, on this very nice album cover, that it will refract in sort of by different amounts depending on the wavelength. So will uh, the refraction from from a sample like this duck. And in the top case of the optical microscope, uh, this is fine because what happens if you have uh, sort of lots of different wavelengths or, or sort of lot of lots of incoherence in your beam. Um, the well, it will diffract in different ways, but the lens that will sort of uh, work as an, as an inverse of this will bring it all together perfectly in the image plane. So it doesn't matter that you have this mix of different wavelengths. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of current diffractive imaging, uh, you will just get sort of a mess of, of diffract many different uh, sort of diffraction patterns corresponding to different wavelengths. Uh, and it's at least today it's impossible to uh, work out sort of what part came from which wavelength and so on. So that's why we need for this type of imaging to work, we need coherence. Um, and these kind of experiments in practice, they can they can look vastly different. Here I'm just going to show you, you know, two examples. On, on the left, it's an experiment more to test uh, the source that they were building. Um, where the image uh, sort of animated silicon nitride object. Um, and on the right, we have uh, an experiment where you aerosolize small biological particles like viruses and hit them with a free electron laser beam. So it's two very different experiments, but you know, the same general setup and the same general principles. Um, and to understand what we can do with this data, so essentially the name of the game today is going to figure out like how, what can we do with the diffraction pattern that you can see in, in both these two images and um, sort of what does it mean that what we see there and how can we try to interpret it uh, and to answer the first question what does it mean uh, i'm going to use this formula i don't know if you recognize it but it's something it's what's called the Fourier transform and it's sort of very common actually in um, image processing in, in many ways but so it's sort of we're very fortunate that it turns out uh, to have such a prominent role in uh, in diffraction. And, and just sort of briefly, like I'm not going to derive exactly why the Fourier transform has this role, because if I, when I do this to undergraduates, it's usually like a two hour lecture. Um, but just sort of very briefly, like the, the assumptions that goes into this is essentially sort of if you look at the, the blue part here, the exponential, essentially we're saying that each point 
uh, or, or each point source refracts uh, sort of equally in, in all or more or less equally in all directions. And what you can see down there is sort of an illustration of that, where you can see the wave fronts uh, coming sort of out from, from one point of the sample. Um, now the next part, the density rho. Uh, the meaning of that is that okay, we, we have this these point sources that that sort of refract radially in all dimensions, but they uh, and the density their their rho will determine how strongly each point will refract. So that's sort of that part. And finally, to bring it all together, the the integral over dr just tells us that each point in this sample uh sort of essentially scatters the independently and sort of by integrating over all of this we see sort of how the different points interfere and so on so that's sort of a very brief explanation for why the Fourier transform is, is important here or why the Fourier transform essentially describes refraction um, i should mention though before moving forward that, that you know this is kind of a simplification so the two main or the most important simplifications that we've done here is one called the born approximation which essentially tells us that the the light that hits the beam, so most of it just goes straight through, and uh, the diffraction is, is weak. And the reason why that's important is that we can neglect the interaction between the already scattered light and the sample. Um, and we're also going to use the Fraunhofer approximation, which more or less tells us that the distance from the sample to the detector is large, and it's large meaning that it's large compared to the size of the sample and the size of the wavelength, the length of the wavelength. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you now a few different examples of Fourier transform. I, I find this you know, useful because um, sort of when looking at diffraction patterns, it really helps to have seen a bit of Fourier transform and sort of get an intuitive feeling for what the Fourier transform does to a sample or to an object. So, so starting, I'm, I'm just showing you here the sample to the left. So here it's just a circle. And to the right, I'm showing you what the diffraction looks like, and I'm showing you the amplitude and the phase. So as you know, the Fourier transform, it's a complex transform, so you will get complex numbers out. And in the fraction, these two, these numbers, uh, so which is the amplitude, which is just the length of the complex number, and the phase, or sometimes argument of the complex number. So the amplitude is just, you know, the, the strength of the wave at that point, and the phase is uh, sort of this argument. and the, and, and it corresponds to, in physics, to essentially a, a shift of the wave. Um, and I think uh, for most of these, it's most important to keep track of what happens with the amplitude. So you can see a circle uh, will just will have a diffraction that essentially is spherically symmetric, more or less. And you can see these like um, sort of waves or you know, wave-like structure going out from, from the center. You have a big speckle in the center. So it's very characteristic. And, and is also the kind of you, you would expect if you have, for example, a, you know, just roughly spherical particle. Um, if we try to make the same sample, like the same sphere, oh, I, I should mention before moving on also that, uh, and the reason why it's not perfectly symmetric, so why you have these wiggles in the corners, it's just because the pixel size of the of the sample that sort of starts to play around. So, a um, perfect circle would be perfectly symmetric. Um, moving on to if, what will happen if we just make this sample larger. So let's have a look at a, twi a sample twice or a circle twice as large. And you can see that the Fourier transform it also scales, but it scales inversely. And, and this is very characteristic for the Fourier transform that you know if you make something bigger in real space so, or in sample space, you make the Fourier transform of it you know scale down with with sort of the same amount. Um, and you can also see, of course, that if we go in the other way, we make it smaller, we make the Fourier transform sort of wider instead. Um, here, I only have a few more of these. Um, we, oops. So if we do a square, uh, we can see that, you know, it has the same kind of behavior, but instead of having this radial symmetric, now that we break the symmetry in, in real space, we obviously break the symmetry in Fourier space as well. And, and what we can see is that uh, or, or the reason why it looks like this is that, you know, we have these vertical and horizontal edges and, you know, the top and the bottom edge will interfere with each other and therefore give a strong sort of vertical streak in the pattern and uh, the same for the horizontal streak and the other two edges. 
if we start to scale this one, for example, we make it wider in along x, we get the same kind of inverse behavior that on the x-axis it now becomes smaller. Um, we can also say that it's rotation invariant. So if we rotate the sample, the, the diffraction rotates the same way. Um, and, and last thing, if we go back to the original square, last thing I want to want to show you is that you know if we change this sample a little bit, but I'm just going to add you know random structure inside this square. So you can see that it looks like this. And uh, so what's happening here is actually quite interesting. So the, the both amplitudes and phases they look more or less the same as the previous one in the central part of the diffraction. Pattern. If I go back and compare again, so from this to this. So the central parts are, are the same, but the outer parts look quite different. And, and what we're seeing here is actually another very important feature of the Fourier transfer, which is that the central parts code for low resolution information, and the outer parts, they code for high resolution information. So when we added this noise, we didn't change that much in the sample on, on sort of the low resolution scale, and therefore the central parts are sort of remain intact. But we did change a lot at high resolution, so the outer parts of the Fourier transform are completely different. And, and, and sort of just to put this into formulas, you can, you can actually say that the sort of the, the resolution that is coded by a particular sort of place in Fourier space can, is given by this formula. So it depends on the wavelength, which is not surprising, but then it also depends on the scattering angle, theta. And so the scattering angle being, you know, uh, where you, I mean, obviously, in a diffraction pattern with a low scattering angle, you will end up close to the center of the detector, and a high scattering angle, you will be close to the outside of your detector, and that means also far out in Fourier space. Um, okay. However, and if we sort of imagine the more realistic example, so here it's still a, a simulated object on the left, but I've made something that maybe looks more like it might be a protein or maybe a virus with some internal structure, for example. Um, and, and here you can see that, well, the amplitude, it's, it's sort of still, it's interesting, it has more features and definitely the phase has a lot more information than, than it had before. Um, the problem in the sort of experiments that I outlined at the beginning or, or sort of any kind of CDI experiment really, is that this is not what we measure. We don't measure amplitude and phase. I mean, if we did, this talk would essentially be over now because Fourier transform is a very nice transform in, in that you know, it has a well-defined inverse. So you can, just, you can just take your amplitude and phase inverse Fourier transform and get back the electron density of the sample. Uh, however, uh, detectors, at least X-ray detectors, they can generally not measure phase. Um, so, we're stuck with, with essentially the amplitudes. And we don't measure the amplitudes directly either because we measure what's called intensity, which is the amplitude squared. Um, and it generally corresponds to just the energy content of the wave. Uh, but also what you can see is that we usually have a limited signal, quite often at least, uh, because there's a sort of finite number of photons uh, being reflected by the sample. So there's a finite number of photons or sort of that, that hits our detector. So the amount of information is also limited. And so, so the problem or the name of the game for, for you know, most of this talk is, is the question like, how do we get from the middle picture like this, these intensities? How do we figure out what the sample looks like? And, and sort of this is the, the problem that we have to solve because we couldn't use a lens that, that would otherwise kind of do this for us. Um, and someone might, might ask them like, after having seen the previous images, the, the faces often look quite uninteresting. Or um, so, so, so you might ask, like, do we do we really need them? Or like, how how bad is it really? So I'm going to show you like a classic example um, of of sort of where I start with actually Fourier transform of me and this old picture of, of Dina that I managed to find somewhere online. Um, and I've calculated the Fourier transform, or essentially then the diffraction that we would get from my face and, and Dina's face, uh, respectively. Uh, and you can see that you know they look somewhat somewhat different, sort of have some similarities. And and so this classic example it tells you that okay, just try to switch places, switch the faces from from one to the other. So okay, let's let's do that. So now I not I now at the top have my amplitudes 
combined with Dina's faces and in the bottom Dina's amplitudes combined with my faces. And if if it turns out to be true that you know the faces are not that important, then then my picture at the top should still look pretty much like me, and, and you must look pretty much like her. Uh, so if we look at the inverse Fourier transform of this, we can see that it's actually not the case. It turns out to be the other way around that the faces seems to be sort of more important actually to if you want to sort of recover these two pictures of our faces. Uh, some people use this argument to say that you know the faces carry more information and and and. To some extent, I guess that's true, but what's really going on here is that the amplitudes look more similar if you compare to, you know, just poor transforms of two different faces, which means that, you know, if you just replace the amplitudes with some other amplitudes from the similar like object, you're somewhat okay. But the faces are, you know, quite unique, even though the objects are sort of of similar type. And this is true for faces, but it turns out it's also true for, you know, yeah, biological objects, proteins, viruses, but also, you know, most things that we might image with these kind of, of experiments. So it's it's still a problem, even though we can explain kind of why it happens. Um, so we really need a strategy to handle this. And what I'm gonna show you now is essentially the basis for or sort of basic assumption that we use for for most of these algorithms to sort of try to solve this problem, because there are algorithms that do kind of work to solve this, uh, this problem. Um, so uh, the question is kind of, what do we know? We have Fourier space on the left and, and real space on the right here. And in Fourier space, I've shown you, you know, this diffraction is still the same object as, as I used yeah, before I showed in the faces, um, but uh, and you can see that, you know, it's a bit noisy, but we roughly know the amplitudes. Uh, it's just that for every pixel here, we're missing one value, we're missing the face. Um, but okay, so we have information in Fourier space. But what about, and, but what about real space? So uh, in real space, you might just say that, okay, no, we don't know anything there. And, that, and if we don't, then, then we sort of, then the question stops there. But sometimes you can say that, Okay, we know roughly the shape of the object, for example. So, so you can see that if you go from, you know, we don't know what it looks like, but we know that it lives in this yellow area. Um, and, and let's see, if we assume that, let's see if we can do better. And, and some of you might be thinking like, this seems like a very strong assumption. and It's quite reasonable that we don't know this. And, and I will sort of try to relax it a bit in the future, but for now, just accept it. Um, and uh, and that means that you know we can say that everything in, in this sort of blue area outside the yellow part, uh, we know that it's going to be zero. Uh, so that's uh, actually a seriously strong constraint also in real space. So we have these two constraints in first what's called first space constraint and real space constraint. First space constraint is we know the amplitudes, real space constraint is we know that there are zeros outside the part here. And, and sometimes we call this uh, yellow area, we call it the, where the particle lives, we call it the particle support. So I will probably use that word a bit later. Okay, so, so naively then, if you would like to construct an algorithm around this, we might imagine that we start with just assigning random faces, so you can see on the right, random faces to every pixel in Fourier space. And we just keep the amplitudes as the measured ones. And uh, this is of course very likely to be wrong, but as a starting guess, it might be okay. And then we inverse Fourier transform this, which we can now do because we do have faces and amplitudes as well. Um, but of course, it doesn't look anything like the particle that, that uh, sort of that gave rise to this diffraction. Um, but we know something, at least in real space, which is that we know it has to be zero outside of this support. And so we just enforce that by putting the rest to zero. Uh, and if anyone is confused by the fact that we have uh, faces in real space as well, it's sort of Fourier transform doesn't care. It's a complex, uh, it's a complex transformation, um, but it's usually a good sign if the particle turns out to be real, at least for biological particles, which usually don't introduce any kind of phase shift. Some particles do introduce phase shift, and then then you know it's it's not confusing that you see the face also in real space. Anyhow. Uh, okay, so we now have a new guess for what the particle looks like, and we can sort of test that by forward Fourier transforming and seeing what the diffraction from this sample would look like. And obviously, it doesn't really match the, the sort of the top, the, the measured ones. 
but what, what our hope is that the faces will at least be better than the random start. So we, what we do then is we enforce this Fourier space constraint, which is replace the, the new amplitudes with the measured ones, uh, but keep the faces that we sort of got. And we get something like this. And the faces will look a bit different at the outer parts, and that's only because we don't have zero signal there, and, and sort of the faces kind of all defined for zeros. But for everywhere where there is a photon, you know, we keep the face from the bottom part and the top part. And then we just, you know, keep going around like this and, and updating the real space, and then we get an updated Fourier space, and you can see that it changes ever so slightly. And I'm not going to sort of click through the entire reconstruction, but um, I'll try to show you a video instead. So at the top, you can see the sort of goal. And at the bottom, you can see the evolution of the amplitude and the phase. And you can see that, you know, it slightly sort of changes slightly and, and, and sort of very slowly, but kind of in the right direction. Um, but also, I think now or very soon, it seems to get more or less stuck and, and sort of not move that much anymore. And, it, and we're still quite far away from the from the true solution up there, even though we gave it a very nice support to start with. Um, and this this is, I guess, in, unfortunate into uh, but quite common if you use this very simple algorithm. And and to explain what happens, I'm gonna I'm gonna show a different way of thinking about these algorithms. So they belong to a set of algorithms that's called convex optimization algorithms. And uh, the way to think about them as, as convex optimization is to just imagine that we have all the, all the possible, like they have the space of all the possible solutions. And then we have two sets, the, the top one, which is all the solutions that fulfill the Fourier space constraint, or all, all the possible objects that fulfill the Fourier space constraint. And at the bottom, we have instead all the possible ones that fulfill the real space constraint. And, and ideally, like we're looking for, for this intersection, like this small point that, that fulfills both of them. And, and the way we do with this algorithm I just explained to you, uh, what will actually happen is that you know, we start somewhere fulfilling the Fourier space constraint, constraint, and then we project first the real space constraint by enforcing that, and then we project on the Fourier space constraint by enforcing that, and we sort of keep going and get closer and closer and closer to the solution. But you can also see that the closer we get, the slower we get. And, and sort of that was clearly happening before. But in addition to that, this image is a bit simplistic. So first of all, we do have noise and we maybe our support is not correct. So it might be that these actually don't meet, or, or not just might be, but you know, essentially in reality, it's always like that. Uh, so they don't meet perfectly. Uh, and these sets might not be convex. So real space constraint, first of all, turns out it's actually convex and it's even nicer. It's, it's actually completely flat, even though it's flat in the sort of very high dimensional space, but it's a very well behaved set. The Fourier space constraint, however, is not. And it turns out it is, yeah, it's non-convex. So I'm gonna draw it like this. That it, it's, and this means that if you run this algorithm, there, there's not only one point, you know, where you have a local minimum, like you can get stuck like, like this one got, and which I'm sure is also what happened in the movie I, I just showed you before. Um, so, so this algorithm, which is called error reduction, because you know it's, it keeps getting better, and you can see often you call, uh, sort of defined as the error, it's the length of these projection arrows, so essentially the length between the real space and Fourier space constraints at your solution. And this error will always go down with this algorithm, That's, you, can, you can easily prove that. But uh, that also means that if you end up in one of these local uh, minima, you're never going to escape from it. And, and yeah, so, so this is what happened. So for this reason, there are tons of different, uh, different algorithms that somehow are variants on this. So I'm just going to show you some results from one of them called hybrid input outputs, which is, I think, it's a quite old algorithm. It's from the 80s. Um, but it's uh, still used um, a lot today and even in published papers today. And essentially, the, as you can see from these arrows, the Fourier space constraint is applied in the same way, but the real space constraint is, is not. It's sort of, as you can see, also, it kind of often overshoots a bit. And the amount that it does it with is, depends on uh, sort of how far down it was in the previous example. It sounds a bit complicated, but the effect will be 
that when you sort of keep running it, as you can see that it gets sort of starts to get stuck in the local minima, but if it's stuck in one place for a long time, uh, it will sort of jump further and further and further for every iteration. And sort of given time, it will end up far away from it so that the actual, um, in this case, the actual best solution sort of uh, actually is closer in the next for space projection. Um, so, and, and from using this algorithm, you will see that it seems sort of more random and more energetic, but it means that it can escape from these uh, this local minimas and, um, um, and, and yeah, generally performs much better. So I'm going to show you now the same um, example as before, but with hybrid input output. And I've actually slowed this down by a factor of two, I think, or four, maybe compared to the previous one. So just for you to have any chance to see what's going on. Okay, so let's run it. So you can see it sort of starts to be quite, you know, random and energetic, but after a while, it really seems to find the correct minimum and, uh, you know, focus down quite well uh, in that one. So here we see that we got a much, much better reconstruction of the, uh, of the object than what we got before. Um, okay, so, Moving on, I'll just briefly mention and for, for sort of anyone who's interested, you know, I've mentioned now two algorithms, error reduction on the top and, and hybrid input output or HIO. There are tons of different ones that are sometimes used. One is called RAR, one is called difference math, and, and, and there are more, but these are maybe the most uh, commonly used ones. Um, both of the other two, they behave somewhat similarly to, to HIO, RAR is maybe slightly less energetic. Uh, sometimes if one doesn't work, you can switch to the other. But in my experience, also when you start to switch algorithm like this, it's usually a sign that something doesn't work anyhow. Um, and in addition to that, I didn't mention, but you know, people sometimes apply other extra constraints. So, for example, um, now I, I did let the real space vary however it wanted essentially, but you can also add additional constraints such as the electron density has to be positive, which is very reasonable, uh, or even that it has to be a real object, which is reasonable for for example, many biological objects. Uh, you might be able to add sparseness, which would mean something that tries to find, you know, atom positions instead of, so encourage there to be empty space around the strongest scattering uh, points, for example. So, and, and there are many extra constraints like this that might also make the algorithm better. Um, and um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna very, very quickly say, it's okay, Someone might be wondering, like, are we only using these convex optimization algorithms? And, and, and because it seemed like they're not quite made for this type of non convex sets. And people are experiencing with, you know, gradient descent. And I, I made this attempt a few years back to try an optimization on a method called simulated annealing. Um, and this is of a, of a different object. And it, it, it turned out like this, this example, for example, it turned out to somewhat work. Um, and, and the nice thing with it is that, you know, simulated annealing being a general, more general optimization algorithm can, can optimize any kind of function. So you can, I can really look into, you know, I want the object that on a sort of probabilistic level best explains the intensities um, sort of assuming Poisson statistics and things like this, which is not really possible with, with HIO. Um, but, and it turned out, I was actually surprised by the fact that it, that it worked. It, uh, it did manage to reconstruct the object somewhat, but the solution is actually worse than HIO, even though it can do this nice assumption. Um, and in, a, in addition, um, I think it runs about a thousand times slower or something like that in the shape to get to a similar kind of reconstruction. So uh, essentially this is more like, a, yeah, cool. It, it is possible to use other methods, but, but so far I haven't seen anything that comes anywhere near these convex optimization type algorithms in, in terms of quality. Um, I said earlier that, you know, what about if we don't know the support? What about like that assumption about the support seemed like a fairly strong one. And, um, and, it's, and it's true and often we don't know it, but uh, it also turns out that if we don't have a tight support, if our support is a bit bigger, like on the right, very often we, we can't recover the object well. Um, so these algorithms are quite sensitive on the support being, being nice and tight. Um, so, and if we, like as an example, if we try to run the same algorithm 
uh, as before, but instead with this much looser support, we can see that even given a lot of time, this will sort of never converge to a good solution. But we do see something else that is interesting, which is that we start to see the shape of the object somewhat. So it's, it gets something right, but it has probably figured out whether density should be inside or outside of it and so on. So there's like too much freedom for it. Um, but the fact that it gets something right is still interesting. Yeah, so, and, and based on this realization, there is an algorithm that's called shrink wrap that tries to solve this by continuously updating the support so during regular intervals. So, so you start usually by, uh, you know, taking, and, and this is actually starting from, you know, 20 iterations in and then repeating this every 20 iterations in, in, in my example here. Um, you start by running error reduction a few times, even if this is not the algorithm you're running, you're using it just to make sure that you know you get the best possible you get down to the sort of minimum of that particular local minimum that you're in and uh, so run a few in this case five iterations of error reduction uh, and then blur it and in this case i blur it with about three pixels and the reason is that you know we probably can't trust the high resolution parts of it but maybe the shape of it is sort of better than the original shape that we had that's the hope and then we use this to sort of take the stronger part of this to calculate the new support. Um, and if, again, I'm gonna show you now the same uh, reconstruction uh, using this method, and you can see that the support updates every 20 iterations, and it quite quickly actually goes gets down to something that is very similar to the support we had. And it even turns out, you know, this support becomes a little bit tighter than the, than the previous one because that one was not, you know, super well optimized. Here you really get the sort of a very tight support and, and therefore you can get a nice reconstruction. But the big benefit is not to get a, a better reconstruction, the big the big benefit is obviously just that, okay, now it's possible to do these kind of reconstructions, but without knowing the support in advance. Um, so, uh, okay, so moving on. I want to take also just a little bit of time, especially for any of you who have a crystallography background, to, to explain sort of the relationship to, to that and, and sort of the reason why this is possible because sort of famously in, in crystallography, you need some kind of, always need some kind of extra information about the sample to be able to, to solve it, so to be able to you know, face it and, and recover the three structure. And so how can it be that it's possible here, but not like in CDI, but not in crystallography? And uh, it, to compare it, let's just sort of recap what, what crystal diffraction is. So here to the left, you have you know the same sample and to the right, it's diffraction pattern. And if we start to create like this crystal, here's a very, very small crystal. You can see that you know, the interference between positions of these um, molecules will create this kind of um, almost like a double slit experiment like pattern, but you know, both horizontal and vertical directions, but it will be only be modulating the um, the original diffraction pattern of it. So it's sort of, sort of the same kind of information is already there. But if you make the crystal larger, what you can see happening is that these peaks, so-called bright peaks, they become more narrow and they become much stronger. And if we sort of keep making it larger like this. So for a very large crystal, we have essentially only information at these peaks, but nowhere in between. And here, like in my simulation here, you can still see it a little bit, and that's partly because I use logarithmic scale, and partly because the crystal is still very small compared to this Um So, um, uh, and this sort of brag peaks. Uh, essentially, this means that in crystallography, you only get information at these brag peaks, uh, which is, and and they happen to be spaced at what's called critical sampling, meaning that if you only know the information there, you have just about the information that you need to recover the object. Uh, if you knew, knew the faces, but, but we don't. So that means that you can't and we need to figure out the faces some other way. And another way to see this is to say that in the crystal, there's, there's no space for support. Like there's no space around the object that we can say has to be zero. Uh, another way to understand this is just by, by looking at, again, at the diffraction pattern from a single particle. And then I, if I change the sampling of Fourier space. So essentially to reduce the pixel size of my detector and see what happens in real space. So if I reduce it from originally 1024 was my pattern and here it's 512 on the side, uh, which you can just see by, by this becoming slightly more blurry. Um, 
Uh, and in on the left one in real space, this uh, example actually, you know, we we retain the same resolution, but what's left uh, or what's changed is that the field of view, so the empty space around it, is reduced. So if you keep making the right more pixelated, you can see that the space around it becomes you know, sort of less and less, and until we reach this point, which is critical sampling, this is the same kind of sampling that we would get from the Bragg peaks. Um, and you can see that there's no space anymore around the sample at all, uh, which means, which is why there's nothing that we can set to zero, which means that we have no real space constraint. And this is why, um, why crystallography doesn't, uh, or in crystallography, you can't face the, uh, the pattern correctly. But it also means uh, that if your detector has pixels of the size uh, that you see on the right, well, this method also doesn't work. It only works in the case where you have, you know, a high sampling rate. So, uh, and this is usually called oversampling, as you can see in the headline here, that, that you know, we need oversampling to be able to, uh, to do this kind of direct phasing. Um, okay, so I now want to talk about, I think something that is very important. So I'm going to, Talk about one um, one common problem in in phase fuel, and I this is I haven't seen this sort of presented in, in many other ways. Like there, I know there is at least one paper that, that deals with it, but but it's something that you know you can see published papers that that don't sort of realize this problem. So, and it has to do oh, sorry, and it has to do with missing data. Uh, so essentially, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain when is missing data in in your in, in Fourier space or missing data on your detector, when is that going to be a problem, uh, and when is it not? Um, so again, let's look at our constraints. We have the real space constraint and the Fourier space constraint. Uh, so one way of putting this is that you know in Fourier space we know the values uh, or the amplitudes everywhere outside of this red region in the center, uh, and, and why are is there this hole in the in the middle, why don't we measure there? And I mean, sometimes maybe you don't have it, but often because of the Born approximation that you know, you know you're always gonna have a very strong beam uh, going through the sample and it might damage your detector. And, and that's why it's very common to have a beam stuff. But sometimes you will have missing regions because your detector is made of modules and there's a bit of gap in between and so on. Uh, but okay, so in this case, we uh, don't know data in this red region. And in the real space constraint, we have the same kind of situation. This red support, that's where we don't know data and everywhere else we know that it's zero. So you can say that in the blue regions, that's where we have any, that's where we have the constraint. And in the red regions in, in both real and Fourier space, we don't have constraints. Um, so then you can ask yourself the question like, okay, if, if you can create any objects in real space, which whose Fourier transform fits within this red region in Fourier space, then the, then there is no way of knowing how much of that to add to our to our solution for our density. Uh, so that would be an ambiguity in, in this reconstruction. Um, so it's a very interesting question whether such objects exist. Um, and, uh, and and the good the good answer is generally that, that no, they don't exist. But what if, and if I show the same thing in you know one dimensional thing when I run one D for a space to the left and real space on the right, uh, if you imagine something like uh, a Gaussian for example, and and you take you know uh, which for transform that you get another Gaussian because you know for transform of the Gaussian is another Gaussian but with sort of inverse inversely proportional width, you can see that these Gaussians are not uh, neither of them live completely inside the the unconstrained area in the center, but both of them have very small parts uh, outside of the outside of this region. So that means that the constraining power on them is very small. Um, and depending on exactly the size of the missing data and the size of the support, uh, this constraining power might be you know very, very small or not that bad at all. So then like for example, for the reconstructions that I showed you before, how does it how does it look like? And I've actually calculated now the the sort of uh, the object that you know fits the best within both of these two 
unconstrained uh, regions for this reconstruction. So you can see that the yellow outline is the shape of the support and the, and the missing data, uh, respectively. Uh, and you can see that this, this mode, or weakly constrained mode, as they're sometimes called, um, it actually has a lot of density outside, especially you can see it on the support that there's a lot of, of, of density outside of it. And if you calculate how much density is outside, it's actually a lot. It's actually 70%, even though it might not look like that because it's quite weak outside the support, but the combined uh, sort of integrated volume is actually quite large. Um, so, so this is not a problem at all, actually, in this reconstruction. But just to show you how it might look like if you have a significantly larger uh, beam stuff, three times larger in this case, um, you might have something like this. So here, I again calculated this to um, to have sort of, and, and that you can have, you know, the worst possible case is something with a constraining power of only 0.3%. And this is probably going to be problematic. Like it's it's very likely that this ambiguity will, will mean both that you don't know your result very well, but also that uh, your reconstruction might go off in, in weird directions and so on. Um, and in this case, it actually gets worse. Like if I keep calculating, you know, the second least constrained modes and so on, you can see that, you know, uh, all of the first maybe five or something like that are quite weakly constrained. So you have a lot of freedom in the reconstruction that you know you don't have a handle on in this kind of setup. Uh, and um, and okay, this might sound complicated, and you might be wondering like, okay, do I really do I need to calculate all of these things to be able to know whether whether my data like I will be able to reconstruct my data or not, and so on. And, and I mean, of course, of course, that's that's the best. And if, you, if you're interested, like I, I have code to do this. But um, as a general rule of thumb, if you look at these two, like what we can say is that if the missing data region is, is on the order of the size of the speckles in the pattern, you're usually in a good position. And uh, to the right, you can see that the missing data is significantly larger than the speckle size, which is a problem. And in general, like if the general rule of thumb is that if the missing data region goes to at or outside of the of the central speckle, that's usually when problems start to happen. And it's a bit of you know nostalgia for me. This is the diffraction pattern that I spent part of my PhD working on, or not, not that much time, but it was you know, one of the first ones I got. And I worked so hard, and, and I couldn't figure out why all the reconstructions were crappy. And years later, I figured out this with the missing modes, and it turns out that you know. It definitely didn't uh, fulfill this requirement, so I had huge problems with missing modes. Um, okay, so other kind of ambiguities that are usually not as problematic as that one, but still good to know about is um, so here I've showed you the you know just Fourier transform of the sample at the top, but then I show you the Fourier transform of the same sample but center of symmetrically inverted. And uh, because of you know peculiarities of the Fourier transform, it turns out that the amplitudes look identical for these two, and you can see that the only difference is in the it's in the phases. And, but that also means that when we do phase retrieval, we could equally well get either of these two. Um, and in the same way, a shift will also only affect the phases, and we could uh, equally sort of so so our sample might sort of. Um, Look around, but especially this centrosymmetric flip is, is good to know about because if you're reconstructing something, you should always be aware that you know, especially if you go down to molecular level resolution, that you know, if it doesn't fit, it might be because you're reconstructing the centrosymmetrically flipped version. Um, so I realized that I don't have that much time, so I'm going to show you a few more things at least before before taking questions. Um, so, so one thing that I really want to show you is sort of what do we do when, sort of to validate what we get. So because I've showed you now single reconstructions, a few of them, but um, here instead I'm going to show you sort of if I just repeat this reconstruction many times, something like, uh, so here I repeated the same reconstruction, the same reconstruction that I showed you earlier in this talk, and I've done 10 repeats of it. Uh, and you can see a few things. First of all, that we do get both centrosymmetric versions, which is expected. You can also see that sometimes it didn't, one time it didn't figure out uh, which version to get, so it failed in, in that case. And there was another one 
at the bottom where it was just completely failed. Um, and I've also plotted something that's called the error, which is uh, the Fourier error, which is essentially the distance between the two sets at the solution, which I, I mentioned earlier. And, uh, and all the software to do this, they, they report these kind of things. Um, and you can, you can, which is good, you can see that the, you know, the failed ones seem to have worse error, which is, which is encouraging. Um, but what we normally do is, you know, what, or what we really did is we did the face retrieval. So it's interesting to look at, at what happened to the faces and are the faces you know, similar in these different reconstructions or not. Um, and there is a very common measure of, or way of measuring this, which builds on the principle that, you know, if you take just one pixel, so say the, top, the very top left or something like that, uh, and you plot the face in an argon diagram like this, plot the face of each reconstruction of that particular pixel, you can see that, you know, if they're fairly similar, they might look something like this. You know, they all have roughly the same angle, um, but not exactly. If you then take the average of all of these points that this gives you, we get some something, yeah, something like this. And if you do it again, but for an example where the faces are maybe not as reproducibly recovered, so not the same every time, uh, we might get this value. Uh, and so it turns out that you know this, this average that we calculate, um, the distance of that average from the center is a fairly good measure of how reproducible the face was. So how reproducibly recovered was the face in that particular pixel. Um, so for these reconstructions that I did, we can we can calculate that uh, for every pixel, and we get what's called the face retrieval transfer function. Uh, and essentially, it's a way of saying how good was this algorithm at sort of recovering or propagating um, values sort of at di these different parts of the Fourier transform. And we can also calculate the average real space reconstruction, which we see look okay, but it doesn't look perfect because we had these few failed reconstructions that, that mix in together with it. And it will also make the PRDF slightly worse. And also what you will usually see if you, if you read a paper on this is that you plot the radial average of the PRDF, which is very nice because it kind of, as you remember, further out in the Fourier space means higher resolution. So you essentially get, um, Sort of a measure of how well how well did the um, reconstruction work as a function of uh, of um, resolution. Um, now, this reconstruction really didn't look well because of these failed ones. So in practice, what we usually do is that we put some kind of threshold at this error, and in this case, I chose one point three, which sort of nicely sort of sorts out the bad ones and, and it keeps only the good ones. And we redo the PRTF and we can see that it actually looks, looks much nicer. And the average uh, at the bottom also looks, looks really nice. Um, and the, this average, the, the nice thing with, with that, the average image is that you know, this way we know that we only keep you know, the reproducible parts of it and everything that just is an artifact of, of the weird random state start that we used um, is just sort of washed out by this. Um, and uh, quickly want to mention that uh, what we usually do then with this um, PRTF is that we use this kind of arbitrary threshold of, of e to the power of minus one to say that, okay, things were okay, or recovered okay up to that point. And you can see that it sort of crosses the line at about eight inverse nanometers in this case, which means that we have, we could say that we have a resolution of about uh, one over eight nanometers. Uh, uh, however, you should be aware when you do this that now I only used eight images to sort of put into this and just completely random faces like on the left with eight images will still get an average about 0 0.35, which is very close to one over E. Um, so for this reason, if you do this in practice or if, if someone publishes a paper, uh, like you should definitely have at least more than 100 repeats or something like that for this PRTF to be to be reliable. And, and this is also a very common problem I see in lots of published papers is that they don't use uh, don't use enough repeats for this to be reliable. Um, so uh, last couple of things I, I, I really would like to show you before, <laughs> so before I let anyone go, is 
just to say this, so, so so far I've only been talking about uh, three er, about two dimensional Fourier transforms, two dimensional samples, and so on. And and in reality, you know, our our object that we've been playing with, what you've seen is a projection of it, and uh, it might look something like like this uh, in three D. And uh, the three D object will of course have a three dimensional Fourier transform that will look something like this. Obviously, values everywhere, but um, um, but I've just sort of made these three cutouts of it for you to sort of see see parts of it. So this is the Fourier transform of it. Um, so uh, so what is it that we actually collect on our on our detector? And and it turns out that for a particular detector setup in geometry, you can see the black point is the interaction region. That's where the sample is. Uh, what we the part of Fourier space that we see is. Uh, something that you know retains the same geometry, um, sort of the same maximum angle as the um, as the sort of maximum scattering angle collected by the detector, um, but it will be a, a sort of spherical section from uh, from this Fourier space, um, and this sphere is actually called the Ewald sphere, and this is sometimes called the Ewald construct. Uh, if your scattering angle is small, that means that you know this is more or less a plane. Um, a plain section of Fourier space and, and sort of all the assumptions that we did for 2D imaging, 2D imaging earlier are still going to be valid. Um, but if you have a very high scattering angle, that, that means that you can't really do 2D imaging very well, uh, which is the case in, you know, crystallography, but also many other types of, of tomography where, you know, combine many different diffraction patterns. Um, so what do, you, what do you normally do is that, okay, we know that one one diffraction pattern only gives us, you know, this kind of information about the Fourier space. But if we have a sample that we can that we can rotate, that essentially means that we will rotate the part of Fourier space that we uh, that we measure. Uh, so with sort of five consecutive experiments, we might get, you know, these five consecutive sections of Fourier space image. Then we, if we just keep rotating, we might fill up the entire Fourier space. Um, and after doing that, we can solve the phase problem in exactly the same ways in 3D as I showed you in 2D. So, so 3D imaging actually, if anything, works a bit simpler. So I'm going to show you now after sort of after doing this and running the reconstruction, um, what you get towards the end is something like this. So you can see that, yes, 3D imaging also works quite well. Uh, and yeah, essentially everything I've told you about 3D imaging carries over perfectly to, or everything I've said about 2D imaging so far carries over perfectly to, to this case of 3D. Um, so I, I've talked for an hour now, so I um, I would like to sort of take a break and, and um, uh, see if there are any questions. If anyone is super interesting, I, I have a few more slides, but they're not on methods, they are sort of on, on my applications of this using free electron lasers. So if anyone is super interested, you can you can ask for it and I, I'll have, be happy to talk about them. But I think uh, it does make sense to sort of keep everyone around. So um, yeah, I want to open up for for questions and yeah, then also let you know if there is anyone who's interested in, in looking at the last maybe five, seven slides or something like that about free electron lasers and biology and, uh, and CDI. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you, Thomas. Thanks for a really nice talk. Uh, I'm taking over after Dina, uh, yeah, sharing the end of this session. Uh, if anyone has questions, uh, you can ask them right away uh, by raising uh, the hand. I guess I can see this. Um, or just type your question into the chat. I actually have a first question from Dina before she left. Uh, yeah is uh, how easy to find or code your own phase retrieval code? Uh, and what does it take to gain expertise in this kind of uh, analysis? Is there any tricks uh, that an expert can teach uh, us beginners? So, so for, yeah, first of all, to, you know, to code it, it's, I think to just implement a basic error reduction or, or HIO, it's not that many lines of Python code so, or, or any, any code. So it's not hard at all. And I think if anyone is getting into it, I mean, I think it's a it's a good experience to to have. Uh, but but if you if you really want to sort of be serious about it, um, 
the, the I mean, there are more, you know, production codes, like a colleague of mine, Philip Maya, he sort of is, has made a very nice version. And if you use his, his code, it will run very fast using uh, sort of being implemented on graphics cards and so on. So you will get maybe a speed up of more than a factor of 100 compared to your own code, probably more like a factor of 500 compared to running your own code. Um, so I, I would still suggest that if you're like, if we're going to use this for some serious analysis, I, I suggest checking out this package or something else that already exists. Um, because especially doing these like 100 or, or more different repetitions of the same reconstruction, and especially if it's in 3D, it can take a long time with, you know, home rolled code. Uh, and any, any tricks, I think, one one good thing is just you know to gain some to gain some experience like that's that's if I compare myself with you know someone who has is fairly new in the field the main difference I see is that you know I've seen stuff before I've seen things fail in many different ways before and you know figured out <clears throat> what might be wrong and so I think just you know just getting experience and trying different algorithms is is probably the best. But if you want to do that, like I also really suggest not to just, you know, take whatever data set you get in your own experiment. Uh, I think maybe the best advice is actually just to ask some someone or, or look at some repository online for, you know, already published data and see if you can repeat the result because then you know it's something that, that will recover well because um, otherwise it might be, like doing my PhD, like it, it, it might be very hard to realize that you're working on an impossible problem. Mm. Or ask experts for some advice in the beginning, yeah. I guess. But, but I, and I think that's 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 good, and that's like maybe the next step. But what might happen is still that the expert either looks at it and it's obvious, but it might also be a problem like that they haven't seen before, and they're like, hmm, and, uh, and they will have to start sort of working on it themselves to, to figure out what's what's problematic. But I think at least I've covered now some of the common, like in this talk, some of the problems that are commonly unknown to people, people who are sort of getting into it, like with the problems with missing data, for example, and that, uh, that can cause a lot of headaches if you don't, if you don't realize what's going on. Okay, anything? Any more questions? I have probably uh, just uh, finalizing one general, like what are there Ah, we have a question now. I am. If there is a really a lot of missing data, large inactive areas in the detector, what are the possibilities to retrieve the image? Have you tried combining phase retrieval with holography? Or oh, you are here. Okay. <laughs> uh, right. So first of all, okay, what's the if you have a lot of missing data? So so one way to, or maybe the nowadays the the sort of best way I would say is that if you if you go back to Let's see. If you go back to this slide, if you take a lot of different images of the same three-dimensional Fourier space, you, it, it might not be a problem if you have missing data in one of them because you know it might be covered by by another. Um, so, for example, though, if you have something like a streak between two mod modules in a detector, if you just keep keep rotating, it might always be in the same place. But if you have the possibility to maybe rotate the detector, for example, or, or rotate the sample in sort of several directions, you might be able to make sure that in 3D things, you know, the missing data don't always line up. And that's a way to, to solve this. Um, otherwise, if you can only get one shot from, from each sample uh, and you have a lot of missing data, it's just really hard. Like sometimes you might be able to not really do a reconstruction, but still figure out something just from some other type of analysis. But it's it's just tricky, but um, but yeah. So so but if you can do three D, then then you're usually fine um, in, in terms of missing data, as as long as your beam stop is not super large, because then you know you're going to cover all different angles, and there's going to be no way of making them and line up. Um, and then phase retrieval with holography. So um, a little bit. So I guess there are two approaches. Either you know you can just do direct holographic, like if you have a very small reference and and it sort of works well. You don't have to do essentially any of this. And I think that maybe it will be a, we could talk later in the series about these kind of things. Um, and, and I think, you know, it works very well. Uh, the only problem is that the size of the reference will determine the kind of resolution that you 
can reach. Um, but I know that people have, have sort of experience with uh, just you know doing this type of place retrieval, um, but enforcing. Uh, as I, I talked about, you know, additional constraints as you can enforce reality or something like that. You can also enforce that we know some part of real space that, okay, here we have uh, this holographic reference, and then it might even be significantly larger than, you know, just a point source or something like that. And, uh, and, and, and that I have tried a little bit, but I'm mainly seen other people sort of do that, and, and it seems to work quite, quite well often. Like, it's this extra constraint really helps um, in recovery. I don't know if this was related to your first question. Uh, so I've never tried to use that to, um, to sort of really get around the problem with missing data. Um, but my guess is that, yeah, if, if the missing data is not super large, I, I see that it could work because information from because information is also present in the interference that is maybe part in, in sort of other parts of it. But I would really have to try before you know, saying anything too certain, but I think it would be an interesting, um, interesting thing to try. Um, for example, I can mention in, uh, in crystallography, they, they often use this kind of constraint that they, if they know part of the sort of, that the sample is very similar to something else or that it's sort of part of the sample that they might know, but they don't know the ligand, for example. Which is a bit like an extreme version of the holographic constraint that you know other things, and they can usually do these kind of recoveries even though they have very large regions of missing data. So that's one reason why I think that it's it's, it's not unlikely that it would work. Okay, okay next question. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Maybe the last one. What, uh, what, what would you say the major limitation in the current experiments? You go to XFEL to do this. What so, is the, to, for the resolution, like to yes. reach the ultimate atomic resolution nowadays? So, so for free electron lasers, like, I mean, obviously this, this can be a completely different answer if you, um, if you do some other like synchrotron applications of, of CDI, but, but what I know well, which is, which is free electron lasers. And um, <clears throat> I think, Funnily enough, like the main limitation right now is the background noise. So mm -hmm. it turns out that diffraction, you know, diffraction from, even though free electron lasers are very powerful, diffraction from a single protein or, or even single virus is very, very faint, or very weak. Um, and what happens is that, you know, when we put these into vacuum, we need a little bit of gas and just those gas molecules, they diffract on the order of, of magnitude on the same levels. We get as many photons from the gas as we get from the, from the sample. And uh, so a lot of work now is, is focusing on trying to reduce this amount of gas and, and also trying to reduce other sources of background so that we can study, you know, try to study as small things as, as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also like from maybe my side, I have a student that works like just on trying to figure out how can we deal with the background that will, I mean, some background will, will definitely be left. So from the algorithmic side, we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we deal with it in these, in these algorithms? And it's mainly actually in assembling it into 3D pore space where we have to think about the background, um, or, or at least about sort of the, the noise being bad because after, like when doing that, we will average a lot and hopefully the background will average out a little bit. And, and so for the face retrieval, hopefully the situation is a little bit better, but, um, but it also needs a little bit of work. So that, I think that's the main limitation. Uh, I, I should say this can also be solved by having more powerful FELs, but I think right now we're more closer to reducing the background than getting significantly power, more powerful FELs. Okay, thanks a lot for the nice answers. Uh, I would like to close this session now. If you have more questions, you can uh, ask them directly by email to Thomas and ask yeah whatever you want. Um, you also can send, uh, some feedback or the questions to Dina, I guess, and organizers. Uh, the next meeting will be uh, next week about uh, tachography and extension of CDI into the scanning techniques. So thank you for being here today and uh, have a nice day, I think. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> thank you.